Um, and I am delighted to be back at the World Food Prize uh, at, so, uh, to have this great privilege of, of uh, moderating this panel. I want to thank Ken Quinn, my good friend, uh, for number one, for what he has done to make the World Food Prize and the Borlaug Dialogue one the best global gathering on food, uh, global food and agriculture anywhere in the world. And I know you all agree with me on that point. Uh, and I'm so pleased Ken has given us this chance to bring India into focus at this remarkable forum. I also want to express my very deep appreciation to the two other organizations, apart from my own, that have been absolutely critical to putting this panel together, uh, thinking through how we wanted to approach it and supplying the, 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 the structure and the, and the uh, advice. Uh, I.E. McKinsey um, and Pradeep's colleagues in Mumbai and elsewhere in the world or in Seattle and so forth have all been enormously helpful. And the other is the Chicago Council on Global uh, uh, Affairs, my former organization, which is also a wonderful partner. And uh, both organizations uh, are leaders in thinking about global food and agriculture. Um, we are joined today by four superbly qualified panelists, um, all of whom have come either directly from India or from some other very far away location to be with us today to help us delve into these issues a little more deeply. To my immediate right, Ashok Dalwai, the chairman of the Committee on Doubling Farm Incomes uh, at the Government of India in Delhi. Uh, Purvi Jain, immediately to his, her, his right. Uh, Purvi Mehta is the head for ag of agriculture for, uh, for Asia at the Bill and Melinda Go Gates Foundation. Anil Jain, the CEO of Jain Irrigation Systems, which is, despite the, the name, is not only does irrigation supplies, irrigation to uh, millions of Indian farmers, but also is in food uh, product, commodity processing. Uh, and last but hardly least, Rotash Mal, who is the uh, founder and co-chairman of uh, EM3, which you saw listed in Pradeep's um, uh, slide there, which actually supplies farm mechanization services to also to th hundreds of thousands of farmers. We regret that, that uh, under Pradesh Minister Nara Lokesh, who was originally on the program, could not be with us today. Uh, Minister Lokesh had to attend to cyclone relief duties in Andhra Pradesh, obviously very important. Uh, and we miss his presence, but understand entirely and wish him well uh, in, in those important responsibilities. So we're going to begin by asking the, our panelists to talk a little more broadly in tune with the presentation you just heard about the transformational opportunity that exists today in Indian agriculture. And then we'll turn to a deeper dive on some of the p potential digital solutions in Indian agriculture. Uh, and especially as they apply to a variety of, of challenges for Indian agriculture. And I'd like to begin to, with uh, Ashok Dalwai and ask him about this shift to, to a focus on farmer incomes. This was announced uh, almost three years ago by Prime Minister Modi. It was revolutionary at the time because for decades India has focused entirely on increasing production uh, in order to assure its own food security. So shifting the focus to farmer incomes is enormously important, and we all salute it. Uh, and that is now the responsibility of figuring out how that is to be accomplished has been the responsibility of this committee that uh, Ashok Dalwai has co-chaired. So I'd like to ask him, tell us more about the, the drivers behind this shift to farmer, increasing farmer incomes, and what you see as the p potential of it and also some of the obstacles. Uh, thank you very much and uh, let me begin by thanking Ambassador Quinn for putting India on the stage here. And uh, I would also like to begin by uh, saluting the village boy from Cresco, Norman Borlaug himself, who was the harbinger of change in India in the 1960s. And the new revolution that the Prime Minister of India has initiated is actually carrying the baton from Norman Borlaug that began in the 1960s. Uh, all along in India, agriculture has been welfare-centric. 
what started as a response to the food deficiency in 1960s, it actually traveled very well. It not only conquered hunger in India and achieved a status of food sufficiency, we are now at a stage where we're able to export any quantity of food that the world may require. As they say, success is its own enemy. So we are now at a stage where the high production resulting in surpluses across several subsectors of agriculture and certain segments of agriculture commodities has actually resulted in a disequilibrium in the markets where the supply is more than the demand. And we see the scenes where the farmers who are not able to get good prices because of the excess surplus have now begun to protest on the streets by pouring out the milk on the streets of Uttar Pradesh or potatoes on the streets of Punjab and Uttar Pradesh or down south in Maharashtra. So this, the, same, the story is that we now need to bring an equilibrium between the demand and supply. And as we do this thing, we have to keep the markets in mind. We would like to liberalize agriculture, make it more market friendly, so that it is the demand and the prices that become the incentive for the farmers to produce what the global markets demand, what the domestic markets demand. So in this process, when we call income revolution, that means we now take a step away from green revolution or the white revolution that refers to milk and talk of income revolution that is able to capture the entire value chain right from research up to the stage where the farmers are able to realize money in their pockets. So the basic tenets of all this would be that we would now like to diversify and fulfill those deficiencies where the farmers are able to get better prices. We diversify such that the sustainability factors are taken into account. We then reduce the supply of those commodities where due to gluts in the market, the cobweb model works and the farmers suffer from low prices. So when we're now talking about income revolution or increasing the farmer's income, what we essentially are meaning now is that the farmers should be able to realize better purchasing power, improve their welfare. And we are convinced that welfare of the farmers or any community for that matter is in realizing higher income so that their dependence on government reduces over a period of time. And the welfare centricity of agriculture, which was looking at consumers so far, and farmers themselves were a component of this consumer class, has to now be farmer-centric. That means farmers are an have to be entrepreneurs. So we would like to shift the production basis to the enterprise class. If we want farmers to become entrepreneurs, then they must realize net positive returns. And the net positive returns will come based on three variables. Increase the productivity per unit of land, per unit of cattle, per unit of fish pond and do that at cost efficiency because that's very important. And the third most important is how do we monetize this thing? So these are the three variables that our committee and government of India have been working on to improve the incomes of the farmers and also to improve the welfare of the farmers. As we do this, we also have learned the lessons of green revolution, that the revolution which was based on a technology that was extractive in nature has to be also addressed. So sustainability is very important. When we talk of sustainability, we would like to have natural resource management practices. There has to be resource use efficiency of soil, water, and other factors. And various initiatives that government has already taken are all towards this. And all these new technologies, which are machine-based, are being linked to digital technology. Because unless we have digital technology linked to the machine-based technologies, we would not be able to scale it up. We would not be able to have real-time data, real-time advisory. Because finally, I think I'd end up by saying, Risk management, which is so important, agriculture being a biologically driven process, is risk prone at the production stage, and because of uncertainties in the post-production, it is highly market uh, disoriented. And therefore, technology is, digital technology is required, both at the production stage and the post-production stage. And that's where we begin the income revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Purvi, I'd like to ask you, how is this shift uh, and as a, to a focus on farmer incomes from production. How important is it to small and marginal farmers? We've heard that 80% uh, of India's farmers own holdings or operate holdings of under 
for roughly four acres. Um, so does this matter to them? And if so, how? So I think from a farmer's perspective, this is the shift they've been waiting for for a very, very long time. Farmers in India or farmers in any countries don't farm because they are interested in countries' food security. They farm because they are interested in income and the profitability. And India, as, as, as we all know, and, and we are paying tribute to uh, Norman Borlaug for that as well, uh, you know, having shifts and transformative reforms in agriculture is not a new thing for the country. We've had several of those reforms. Uh, many of them have really transformed the country and its, its, its fruit food production basket, Green Revolution being one, setting up of very large number of R&D centers and, uh, you know, extension networks and education institutions. There has been several reforms. But if you look at the history of all these large agriculture reforms in India, they have all been farm-centric or production-centric and have focused on genetic gain and not necessarily on income gain for the farmers. And, and there has been, so Green Revolution, focusing on food production, uh, bringing that food sustainability and surplus, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Dalwai, was extremely important at that time. But as we look at this shift, this is the right shift at the right time and and. And, and farmers have been, have been waiting for it. When you say doubling of farmer income by 2022, what does it mean to a smallholder farmer? The average farm income right now is 1,480 US dollars per year in India. We are talking about basically taking that to 2,900 to 3,000 US dollars per year. Where will that come from? that will not necessarily come only from increasing production or productivity or efficiency on the farm. It will essentially come from realizing better prices because again, th there is a distinction between farm income and farmer income. So the farmer income will come from better price realization. And our systems are set up very well for or predominantly for production-centric uh, initiatives within agriculture. What is really going to be needed is a shift in a, in, from a production-centric infrastructure to a market-centric infra infrastructure and giving that, that right market access to smallholder farmer. So I think um, you know, if the shift is very welcome. It, of course, uh, is something that the farmers have really, really welcomed. But with that shift, we will also need shift in the, in the, in the business as usual and, and, and making that shift to, to very, very market orientation and shifting from agriculture being a welfare uh, uh, sector to a business sector. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Anil, I'd like to then ask you from a private sector perspective and with the the broad sweep of, of your experience in Indian agriculture, your company's experience. What, what do you see as the principal both opportunities and challenges of this shift uh, to a focus on farmer incomes? If it's going to work, and I don't think any of us is holding the prime minister to the doubling farmer incomes by 2022. That was, that was an inspired suggestion, but very difficult to achieve. Um, but a, the, absolutely the right change of emphasis. What, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities? I think it's a very big opportunity uh, as a country. Uh, but first, when we talk about India, Indian agriculture, or farmers' income, uh, there are different type of farmers. There are farmers who grow one single crop in a year uh, based on some staple uh, you know, agriculture crops like rice and wheat. Their income levels are quite low. And there are other farmers who grow lots of fruits, vegetables, and so on. Their income levels are quite high. To double those farmers' income who are already doing well is not going to be that easy. But with right infrastructure and policies, the farmers who are just growing one crop and doing staple crops, their incomes can definitely be substantially increased. And there you should be ambitious to actually more than double the farmers' income, not just double, because their base level of income is quite, quite low. 
Now, this can be achieved, and this we have seen in our experience three or four ways. One, through increasing the total amount of production. So, for example, using our products and technologies, farmers who used to grow 30 or 40 tons of sugarcane, let's say per acre, now are growing 80 tons of sugarcane. That extra 40 tons of sugarcane from same amount of land with less water gives them substantially higher amount of income. And same goes with cotton, bananas, mangoes, and so many other uh, products. The other way is that the value chain where you take these farmers' produce to the end consumer today and traditionally is that if whatever a farmer is producing, by the time it is in consumer's hand, the total value given to the farmer was hardly 15, 20% compared to the price at which it is being sold to the consumer. I think one need to create that structure that at least 50% of the value is retained by the farmer of what is, you know, anything is sold ultimately to the consumer. And then that would automatically also increase, uh, you know, overall return that the farmer gets. And I can give an example where we have worked with farmers where we have given them knowledge, uh, seeds, or irrigation technology, and we have agreed to buy back whatever they grow. And we try and ensure that they get at least 50% of the finished goods price what we sell. And it has been very successful. These farmers now, uh, you know, have uh, you know, a nice home, maybe a motorcycle, uh, their kids are becoming engineers. That level of transformation has happened literally with thousands of farmers where they are properly connected uh, into a right value chain. Coming back to the larger scenario in terms of challenges to double the farmer's income, if we really think through India uh, that we have 140 million hectares of land under cultivation and about 120 million farmers cultivating that, half of those farmers are growing only let's say one crop based on one single rainy season, uh, what we get in the monsoon. One, now government is spending a lot to create water infrastructure so that these farmers who have access to, you know, only rain water can also get additional access to water in the second season so that they can grow a second crop or do a perennial crop, which require, like orchards or whatever else. Now that will substantially increase the income of these farmers if, because their land remains fallow today. The second part is that the farmers who have access to, let's say, water to do second crop or perennial crops, they are not growing that efficiently. They do just flood irrigation. They just throw the fertilizer. There is no what is called, quote unquote, precision agriculture. And with those uh, introduction of precision agriculture technologies, I think those farmers can improve their productivity quite a, quite a, quite a lot and therefore uh, their income. The third part is the infrastructure, where because of lack of storage infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, logistic, and lack of market connectivity, a lot of farmers lose their produce or you know, do not get the right value for their produce. And if you can adjust that part or solve that issue through the logistical and infrastructure solutions, I think you would be able to also create additional income. So there are three different ways you can ensure the doubling of farmers' uh, income is possible and it will happen. Thank you. Rutash, uh, your company, uh, as well as uh, Neil's company, uh, enormous success, uh, private sector success in Indian agriculture. And your case built from the ground up, literally, <laughs> as well as figuratively. Um, could you share with us what it, what it takes today for a private sector enterprise to be successful in Indian agriculture? Why we hear often that private sector investment in Indian agriculture has been sluggish at best? Um, why is that? What are the special barriers? Uh, what do you think can be done to get more private sector investment and involvement? Hmm. So, Firstly, a comment to a comment. I think our prime minister uh, undershot the doubling farmer's income. Uh, it depends on the definition. Um, if you're talking about net farmer income per square meter, you could well treble it and quadruple it, right? A mere small increase on the top line, a mere compression of the middle line yields doubling or trebling at the bottom. Right, so we we may well surpass this doubling farmers' income story. But uh, to your point, look, there are two reasons. Number one, money seeks money; private sector seeks profit. There isn't a sector as complex as agriculture, particularly Indian agriculture. 
Now, in a situation where, in any case, you're under-technologized, your lands are fragmented, there's a strong nexus between, between economics and politics at the ground level. It takes bravery to jump in there and try and make some, some value out of it. A, it's complex. B, it's complex because of the ground level management uh, situation. But I think all that is changing over the last, um, over the last uh, couple of years. And I think the government has been making the right sounds, the right imperatives to, to make that happen. Second, in a country where there was at one point of time till the very uh, recent future, as recent past, almost an undersaturation in every area. Uh, if you took uh, software or cars or anything else, money found its way there, right? Because the returns were better, there was an ease of doing business and so on. Now that a lot of other sectors are also flattening, and out, flattening out their growth curves, uh, we are moving towards agriculture as, ag in fact, agriculture, education, et cetera, are, are major opportunities and agriculture is finally finding its place. The third is the political imperative. Uh, there is only so many decades that you can talk about volumes of production. Eventually, when the, when the voting population, 60% of that population says, we are looking for fattening our own wallets, that the political imperative and the political dialogue also changes in that direction. Now, all these factors put together are, we are seeing a situation for the last few years that it's becoming easier, so to speak, to draw money draw technology, draw talent, the toughest being the last one into, into, into Indian agriculture. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'd like now to shift our focus to digital innovation. We've all decided that we wanna think about how these tools can be applied to solve some of the problems of increasing farmer incomes and to open new, new vista for farmer incomes. Uh, one of the areas in which this has begun to happen is in the marketing sector. Um, as farmers seek better prices for their produce, more efficient ways of getting their produce to market. And I'd like to start again with you, Ashok, and that is to, to ask you to speak about the Prime Minister's announcement of a new proposal for an electronic national agricultural market. Uh, a very radical visionary uh, approach to this, um, which uh, despite it seeming that way has been a focus of a lot of attention and certainly the government's attention. And in, in a, this is in a context in which 70% uh, of, of uh, Indian farmers today market through informal intermediaries, uh, whether at the village level or on up into to established marketplaces. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the so-called ENAM uh, uh, approach and what's, what it's comprised of and how it's success it's had and what obstacles it's encountered? Yeah, I think I should start by saying there are certain structural weaknesses that Indian agriculture suffers from. And apart from the small and marginal holdings that Indian agriculture is defined by, which itself poses a challenge of scales of economy, marketing is another very important structural weakness. And as you yourself said, that intermediaries have been ruling the markets. Since 60s, we introduced the reforms and set up organized markets called APMCs, Agriculture Produced Market Committees. Unfortunately, these have been wholesale markets, and we never understood that the small and marginal farmers who produce small lots could not access the wholesale market by themselves apart from being at a distance of nearly 50 to 60 kilometers from the farm gates. So now what we have been focusing is to construct a new market architecture, whereby we'll have the foundation of the retail agriculture markets within the proximity of five to six kilometers from the farm gate. Then they feed the wholesale markets called APMCs, and thereafter we also link up with export markets because surpluses have to be evacuated from Indian territories. But what is more important is classical market economics always talks about integrating the markets. The physically dispersed markets have to be integrated. Unfortunately, in India, constitutionally, agriculture, including agriculture markets, are a state subject. And therefore, just as lands have been divided by density of population, Indian market space has been divided by these APMCs. 
So now the only way to integrate these physically dispersed markets across the huge territory of India is to virtually integrate them using the electronic technology. So the Electronic National Agriculture Market, and in short, ENAM, tries to integrate the physically dispersed markets such that the universe of traders increases. What we have seen over the last 50 years since APMCs came to existence, that the traders and the commission agents working within a particular APMC had developed monopoly practices. They had cartelized themselves. Though the act said that we need to physically and transparently discover the prices the farmers produce, they cartelized such that the farmers were not getting benefit of uh, transparent pricing. So now with the virtual integration of one market with another, either within the state or across the state within India, then the universe of traders increases. The traders begin to transparently bid for the lot, and this is what is ENAM. However, just as APMCs became monopolies in the name of reforms, we do not want ENAM to be also a monopoly. We have therefore said both public sector organizations and private sector organizations can set up their alternate marketing channels. There can be any number of alternate uh, online trade platforms. It's the government that has taken the initiative of promoting this ENAM, but parallelly there's one private sector market channel working in one of the states. And we want such alternate channels to come up. When the markets start getting integrated, then we will see that the price discovery happens. And I'm happy to share with you that over the last two years since we introduced this, out of 2,700 APMCs that we have in the country, as many as 600 markets already onboarded onto the platform, and 150 markets on the alternate private sector marketing channel. And now we are targeting another 400 markets to be onboarded within the next two years. So we have 1,000 markets onboarded. We are already seeing that cartelization has begun to break down. And that is the key performance indicator is how many bids are made for every single lot of the farmer. We have seen an average in the country today, wherever onboarding has happened, the bids have increased from 1.8 per lot to 4.8 number of bids per lot. That means when there is a competition, the price discovery is, a, is certainly going to be better and to the advantage of the farmer. Now going a step forward, we want to now bring this electronic integration in the retail agriculture markets. And we hope for the next five to 10 years to set up 22,000 number of retail agriculture markets in the country. We already have traditional conventional markets, which are periodical markets. We would like to use this particular space to set up organized retail agriculture markets. And then they become the foundation. And incidentally, it was the Royal Commission on Agriculture in 1928 which talked about assembly points for the small lots of the farmers. And it has taken so many years for us to think and do that. I guess every idea has got its own uh, time frame. An idea, an idea that was definitely itself. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rotash, I'd love to hear your thinking about the ENAM proposal and what do you think it can succeed and what are its potential pitfalls as well as its promise? So, ENAM, uh, firstly, a very laudable objective, and it's been very well executed. Compliments to the government on that. It has to, it has to face a few challenges. The, the gridlock that uh, exists is the farmer, in spite of these markets, is not exactly free to sell where he wants to sell. Uh, let's remember that this farmer is in debt to the local money lender. The unstated rules of business is that the money lender needs to be sold to, the, uh, sold the produce to, and therefore the produce practically is in control of the money lender. The money lenders, um, uh, the money lender does, wants price opacity whereas the system wants price transparency. So there's already a tension built in, so to speak. Not to take an iota away that the power structure is being chipped at almost on a day-to-day -day basis, and this is the, the right way to go. Now, the second challenge that we're going to face is having the transaction fulfilled. Once the deal is struck, the goods have to move. Once the goods move, the money has to move, right? And uh, on the ground, we are still facing problems like that. Just last week, I was in the apple growing area of Himachal Pradesh. 
Now, while on the ground in the plains, a lot of this is happening for other commodities and for a crop which is absolutely valuable, like, uh, uh, like apple, I didn't see a, a single piece of evidence of that stranglehold of the trader having gone down by even a fraction of 1%. The prices at the farm gate, at the orchard gate, were 8 rupees a kilo for the finest variety of apples. And it reaches my table at 180 rupees a kilo. Right? Somebody is chewing up that value in the middle. So A, excellent initiative. B, it's on the right track. C, penetration has to happen. And D, in order to break that, um, that nexus between money, the money lender, and so on, another major initiative of microcredit, which digital will help solve, and it is beginning to uh, uh, you know, appear, until a few forces like that come in, we might, we might not see the acceleration we want to see. So overall, uh, uh, in the areas that it has gone, the number of markets onboarded, it's a great, uh, a great achievement. But now the intensity of trading has to come in in order to benefit the real, uh, the real guy, the farmer himself. Thank you, thank you. Um, now, Purvi, I'd like to turn to another area where the effort, uh, and the digitally enabled effort, is to uh, give farmers more transparency, more market power, not only in selling their produce, but also in potentially in acquiring inputs and so forth. And that is uh, producer organizations. Known in India, the, the acronym in India is FPOs, for farm, farm producer organizations. Um, and a number of these are starting to come up, and uh, they seem to be quite promising. Uh, could you tell us more about your perspective on that as a mechanism, and especially the, the, with the digital enabling that, would, that could work over time and spread? So, yeah, as you, as you said, farmer producer organization, they have, they have witnessed some amazing growth in, in last four or five years, Marshall. Um, the number of uh, FPOs, the farmer producer organizations growing is almost at the rate of 18% per year in India right now. <laughs> FPO basically means aggregation of farmers. On an average, 1,200 farmers coming together uh, and, and forming an organization. And therefore, rather than acting as individual farmer, whose scale we always complained about, we now have 1,200 farmer, which essentially means about 1,500 hectares of land coming together as one unit. And Smaller the farmer, less advantage the farmer, including uh, women farmers, for example, they, they are getting attracted more towards the, towards the farmer producer organization. It has, it has shown a lot of very, very interesting lessons, uh, but mainly, mainly benefits. The way it changes the entire dynamic for the private sector and for any others is rather than, you know, one individual farmer uh, going out there in the market buying half a, half a bag of urea and taking, uh, you know, say 20 kilos of their produce to the market, we now are having, you know, farmers going out there and buying one truck of urea, which means they have better agency, better negotiation prices. The input cost is coming down to as, as low as about 30 to 40 percent and saving because of that negotiation power. And when they are producing, they are taking uh, anywhere between 100 to 150 tons of produce to the market, which means, again, the price realization goes up. In our experience, uh, in some of the FPOs that we have in a place like Bihar, uh, the, the, the price realization, rather than going individual farmer to FPO, has gone anywhere between 28 to 33% higher price realization just because of the scale. So they suddenly, that smallholder farmer with half an acre of land or one acre of land uh, becomes a serious player in the market. And that, that gives a huge advantage and huge agency. One of the biggest challenge of this kind of aggregation of farmers was lack of transparency within that group. And digital has kind of served it and solved it. We have fascinating examples of about 30% of India's farmer producer organization are, are selling their 
produce now through electronic trading platforms. Uh, private, so for example, the National Commodity Exchange or ENAM or so forth. About 70% of the FPOs are getting credit, uh, you know, the farm credit for their produce through digital services. So fascinating things happening. And one of my, one of my favorite example of that is, and again, it just shows, shows how, uh, you know, the revolution, the cell phone revolution, uh, you know, and, and how cell phone is becoming one of the most important farm equipments. And this is, this is in the matter of five years that it has changed that dynamic. My, my favorite uh, example, and I've written about it, so some of you may have read about it, are women goat holders in Bihar, the poorest of the poor farmers, clicking the pictures of their goat with their little cell phone, uploading them on eBay-like Indian site OLX, and getting their price realized as, as high as more than double for the goats. I mean, it's, it's fascinating what is happening. What is important now is, is how fast we, as the development organization or public sector, or all of us sitting here, can tap into it. Anil, I know you've been dealing with some farmer producer organizations or their or their analog uh, in your own company. What could you? What is your experience of their success and their challenges? I think in terms of success, uh, while you know it's still nascent the whole uh, process, uh, and while the total number is quite large amount of the APOs, but the really successful APOs are still you can really you know, measure maybe about 100 to 200 only across the country. And some of them have done very well. Some of them are actually exporting their produce also and so on. Uh, where they get you know, a stronger leader, an organizer who can help them to bring together all their thoughts and different ideas. And if they can administratively manage better, it is providing good solutions. But if it is, does not, then it becomes an amalgam of people wanting to come together with right intention, but they don't have a good outcome. So I think it's very important that they get this professional help in one, buying things or negotiating on how, how to sell. Uh, but also, they, you know, in India, this whole cooperative movement where people come together usually has been thought process as the, okay, you're going to have election, somebody's going to get elected and so on. And then politicking starts and you lose the, all the major focus on economics. And I think having professional supporter, uh, you know, uh, somebody will manage them is uh, what's going to create the big solutions. In terms of our own uh, uh, experiences, we have actually worked with the farmers to create a kind of uh, somebody who can come together, create a platform where they can use this digital knowledge, uh, all of them, you know, on their uh, cell phone, they know how much they have produced, how much they have sold, how much has been uh, come under cultivation, at what level or steps they are, and when they, you have that sharing of the knowledge, and they can see all the data in their own language uh, on a cell phone on a real-time basis, I think that is when the change starts taking place. That's when you start feeling, yes, it is doable. And otherwise, farmers are very protective. You know, They are entrepreneurs, they are business owners. They don't want to give up their land. They don't want to give ownership of the land. And that's why India is a very unique example where small farmers are bringing about a big change. And it's not going to change. India would always have large number of small farmers, but still they can be very profitable, productive, and progressive, all three put together. And in terms of learning about technology, accepting digital innovation, we have found the farmers who are whether literate or not, educated or not, really you know, going out of their way to willing to learn to use the cell phone, the apps, and so on and so forth. And they are ahead of, you know, even from compared to city folks sometimes. So in terms of challenges, uh, it's more about professionalization and getting the uh, right type of a management structure around this when you come together as an organization. That's a challenge, but uh, this is the only way Indian farmers can move forward because I don't think uh, the, the time has gone where individual farmer wanted to do it because then they're not going to survive. And this is the way they can survive, do well, and uh, it's happening, but it is going to take some more time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to shift now to, to productivity. Uh, we focused a lot on, on uh, the marketplace and the uh, monetization of a farmer's produce. Um, but let's back up to productivity issues because they're also, they're potentially very important 
digital applications to improve productivity. And, and in particular, again, Ashok, I'd like you to briefly, if you would, um, talk a little bit about some of the technologies that your government has been supporting and, uh, uh, to improve productivity, such as uh, accessing technology and monitoring soil health, uh, um, helping farmers manage weather risk. Could you tell us a little bit more about some of the initiatives in that area? And then I'm going to turn back to Anil for a, a brief comment on that. Yeah. Uh, I think India is very, very clear that digital technology is the present and the future. We have a comprehensive policy called Digital India, which addresses all sectors of economy. And there's one particular pillar of this policy called NEGPA, National Electronic Governance Program for Agriculture. Now, under this NEGPA, the focus is to begin with basic ICT. And here we've got different segments. We've got people who access the digital infrastructure. That means they can access websites and web portals. Then we've got people with large number of smartphones so that we can have mobile applications. We've got the third category of farmers who have basic phones and therefore they can, they can access the advisory only through the short messaging services, SMSs. And the fourth who do not have as yet access to the uh, telephony, they can access the services through what is called toll-free numbers. What in India we call as Kisan service, call, Kisan call centers, or the farmer call centers. So these are the four avenues through which we are able to reach out all the farmers. And I must uh, share with you that large number of digital technologies have actually been scaled up. In a country with 130 crore or 1,300 million population, with 48% dependent on agriculture, when we talk of scaling up, what we mean is that even if we are able to achieve, let's say, uh, 200 million numbers within two or three years, I think is a great tribute to the technology and the technology uh, uh, purveyors. Like in, for example, let us a soil health card. As far as productivity is concerned, the one of the ways is that as we now try to bridge the yield gaps between the technically and economically feasible yields and the farmer's yield, we have realized that there's a gap to be bridged. We would like to do with cost efficiency. And that means that particularly soil and water, which are the basics of the natural resource management, have to be used efficiently. So India has now uh, drawn up and has rolled out one of the most massive soil health management system anywhere in the world. All the farmers in the country today get their soil samples tested once in two years on 12 parameters on all the macronutrients, micronutrients, secondary nutrients, and physical chemical properties. And the farmer gets an advice on the nutrient status. And then he's able to now add, uh, take up balanced nutrient management, whether it's agrochemical fertilizers, organic manure, or soil amendments like gypsum, all of that it does according to the nutrition demand. And we have found, a study conducted has already shown, wherever the farmers have taken the advice seriously, the reduction in the fertilizer consumption has come down without compromise of the productivity. In fact, the cost of cultivation on account of good soil health management has been to the extent of eight to 10%, and the productivity has simultaneously increased by 10%. And this shows that in every crop segment now, where you have this evidence-based soil health management, the farmers are going to benefit. So likewise, it is on the weather forecast, for example. We have now rolled out, at least a few states within India have already rolled out a large scale of weather forecasting. And once again, the study shows that wherever the weather forecast advisories were shared and utilized by the farmers, compared to the control farmers, they were able to reduce the risk and the risk associated loss by five to 10%. And Karnataka is a standing example, which is one of the IT capitals of the country. And we now are, in the coming from the coming season, we'll be taking up what is called price forecasting. We realized that one of the ways to negotiate the risk on the marketing side is to advise the farmer on the price and demand forecasting. And the price forecasting based on the uh, statistical ARIMA model, the univariate model, is possible. We can have as good a correlation as 95% between the forecast price and the actual market price. And from the coming next season, for the curry for uh, the next uh, year season, we would be graduating from the univariate model to the multivariate model. That means the weather data can be brought in, the pest and disease data can be brought in. So along with the market 
uh, price forecasting. The multivariate forecasting is going to actually help the farmer to take a production decision. If the farmer can take a production decision, then I think you'd be able to bring in that industrial mechanical process of controlling the supply and then attuning his supply along with the demand that is expected. So I think there are lots of opportunities and we actually are now looking forward to introducing a large number of digital technologies both at the production phase as well as the post-production stage. And of course, the third one, most important, is the pre-production stage. That means the weather forecasting, given the climate change implications, where the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is the food basket of India, is expected to uh, experience a temperature rise of one degree Celsius, going to impact the wheat price. We need to have very strong forecasting of weather, and we are going to base on that. Thank you. Um I now I actually like to pose this same question to both Anil and Rotash, whose companies and uh, are on the ground all over India and in various crops in various regions. So what 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 are the challenges facing scalability? Uh, Chairman Dalmai said at the outset, you know, that a couple hundred million is may not sound like uh, anything but scale in the United States, but in India, it's, you know, maybe. Um, but what are you seeing as the practical obstacles to achieving scale with digital innovations? So I think in terms of scale, right, in India, everything is in the large numbers. Uh, the mobile revolution has been very, very big, and I think that's going to help to scale this up uh, quickly and fast enough. Uh, and we have seen, uh, you know, using, you talked about productivity, using precision agriculture, whether, you know, right irrigation, even fertigation or nutrition, if you provide to the plants, it results into high level of productivity. And it has worked structurally well, but this digital innovation, digital inputs, they need to go along with the physical infrastructure. And that's where I think there's a little bit of uh, uh, divergence. Because physical infrastructure is not moving on uh, as fast uh, to support the digital innovations farmer would like to uh, get done. And where you are able to create both, so for, uh, recently we did in Karnataka a project, uh, integrated irrigation project, where we have put radio telemetry, wireless sensors, uh, where one is able to see the level of moisture under the soil and then accordingly decide to irrigate. Farmers have great higher level of productivity. And because everything is structured, you know, in that about, let's say, 25,000 acres of one single area uh, where you're able to ma manage. But where there are small farmers all over the villages or larger areas, then it becomes that much more uh, difficult. Other is where uh, when farmers decide to get together and get that information, and it's not merely information because a lot of people are just sending SMSs or whatever, but farmers are unable to link that information, convert that into knowledge. And I think once you are able to back up digital inputs along with knowledge transfer to the farmer, where that information becomes knowledge, and that's the, I would say, a challenge, that faster we do that, then we'll have faster the implementation success. I'm gonna echo, um what Anil is saying, but in, in a minute. So a couple of challenges first and foremost. I think the devil is in the details when we talk about numbers of cell phones and penetration and so on. Now, if you were to segregate that into farming sector, non-farming sector, rural, this, that, and the other, the penetration of smartphones is actually quite low in the, in the rural area. It's increasing, it's increasing very rapidly as the price of instruments is going down. But that is a challenge. It will be still two, two and a half, three years, to your point, Ashok, that that is going to happen. Second, what is it that you're riding on the airwaves, right? Information. What does information do? To your point, it has to reach a decision. It has to, you, you said knowledge. I'm saying, what's the decision he's going to take? Third, the, the transformation of content and information into local languages, meaningful, not to a state, not to a district, but to that little area, right? It has its own microclimate, it has its own crop, it has its own complexities. So are we, are we giving 30,000 foot knowledge or 100 feet knowledge? I think that's a major challenge. 
And uh, lastly, I think we are uh, really talking about, um, I, I like to use the word monetization. Look, this is expensive business to, to reach all this to the farmer, right? Who's going to pay for it? So, so far, unless this rides on other paid services, so you go back to the cell phone era, right? Voice you were paying for, but some apps came free with it. So there has to be a monetizability, so to speak, of, of a lot of this stuff, of this knowledge and practices and so on and so forth. And to me, the last one is the most crucial one. Who's paying the bill? It costs a huge amount of money a, to get the apps going, B, to get the information going, put it into local content, make, uh, make, it, uh, make it into the vernacular, and then getting people used to deliver it. But there's a ray of hope, and that is as follows. If penetration is low, you will find every village with at least two or three smartphones. Now, the smartphone gets it, but the word of mouth gets it across, inaccurate as it may be. So, uh, as I said, the devil's in the details, and um, uh, the jury is out as to how long it'll take, at least in my head. So, Purvi, continuing on this theme, um, I wonder if you would uh, share with us your thoughts about um, th this question, whether, given all of this, uh, given the history, given where India is today, given the very promising signs of a transformation in the offing, given that many of India's farmers have already taken advantage of these technologies, where is India along this path moving forward? Is it at the brink of what could become a rapidly uh, accelerating process of change? Um, is it, uh, are we going to, it's, it's more like digital technology at large in India where who would have predicted that at this point there'd be you know, 1.1 billion Indians with a biometric identification, right? And, and not to mention all the, uh, the, the digital, other digital penetration. What, where is India's agriculture on this, on this track? I think, you know, any, anything you say about India's agriculture, the opposite also stands true, right? So there is no single, single track. There are several tracks that are running really parallel to each other. And, you know, this is a country where you see, you know, revolutionary thing happening. You see, you know, if you see, say, for example, productivity data, the same variety uh, of, of rice promoted by the Indian national organization like ICAR in one village gives 3.6 tons uh, uh, yield. Right in the neighboring village, it gives less than one tons per yield, while the world potential would be 7.5, right? So it, it's, it's very interesting how different trajectories move sort of together, and it's very difficult to generalize. But some of the sectors are really going to that, that brink uh, world. And, and some of the sectors, you know, it's very interesting. Most of these experiences that this panel has talked about or we talk about generally or the policies that are, that are there are basically, by and large, based on four or five commodities. Rice, wheat, cotton, sugarcane, milk. What about the other commodities? The growth actually comes there, the income potential comes from there, the nutrition potential is coming there. And these, these experiences are not, not captured enough. And so there are, you know, if you say, for example, livestock, they, while, the, while the agriculture struggles to be at 3.2, 3.5% growth in general, livestock sector consistently, which by the way gets less than 10% of the, of the government money allocated, and yet consistently since 2014 has been growing at the rate of about 4.8 to 5%, you know? So, so there are sectors which, which are going to that brink. There are sectors, uh, you know, and, and commodities that, uh, that, that are at, uh, running at a slower pace. 
So it's, it's, it's very interesting. It, it kind of continues to remain on that crossroads. And, um, uh, but, but I think the, the biggest revolutionary thing will come from making agriculture attractive. And agriculture will be attractive not because of its potentials in the production and productivity or genetic gain. Agriculture will be attractive because of its it, the value it brings as, as, a, as a source of income for a very, very large number of Indian people for whom this is the only or a very important source of uh, livelihood. Excellent. Um, I would like to, to close in our remaining time uh, with a question about a very big issue, and that is climate change-induced weather volatility and variability and we know from the IPCC reports that India is projected to be hit very hard, especially certain sections of India, regions of India, by climate change um, or the weather results. Um, and so in our four minutes remaining, I would like to ask each of you for a one minute answer on how much of a challenge this poses to the kind of transformation we've been talking about. Is it, a, uh, is it going to make a difference at scale, so to speak, in Indian agriculture? Um, how concerned are you about it? What, what do you think, if anything, can be done? So, I, But just a minute each, and then we will conclude. And the, those who remain can go get some lunch, too. <laughs> yeah. The climate change poses a great challenge to India because agriculture is monsoon dependent. And we know that there are already signs of uh, changes in the rainfall patterns, not in the quantum of rainfall, but in the rainfall spread. And of course, the temperature rises. And both these two parameters are going to change the seasonality. And therefore, we would be now called upon to change our agronomic practices, varieties, et cetera, et cetera. And the second important one is that there are already areas which are extremely monsoon dependent. And based on the IPCC's value parameters, of the 700 districts, we have identified 151 districts as critically prone to drought. And now our emphasis would be to develop drought-proofing uh, systems so that the coping mechanisms are adopted by the farmers. So it's going to be a challenge, and therefore, as a part of our doubling farmers' income, sustainability and response to the climate change is also one of the important factors that we have taken into account. I think, yeah, first of all, it would be very naive uh, to, to, um, to underestimate how climate change is going to be impacting. Smaller the farmer, more vulnerable the community, they will get affected more. And therefore, our responsibility towards that, of course, increases. My only thing is these are new sets of challenges and yet another sets of challenges. And it will, it will require uh, more and newer tools in our toolboxes to address these challenges. And I think, uh, you know, the, the approach of, uh, of taking on a new war with an old sword won't work in terms of climate change. And therefore, I think, you know, the Wema discussion yesterday was intriguing. Uh, we do need tools, no matter where they come from, what technology they come from. I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to be willing to bring in more tools to to address this and to basically bring in more efficiency into the into the system. Thank you, Anil. I I believe you know climate change is there and one one is seeing that through the you know differences in weather and the delay in monsoon or less or more or difference in the heat or cold etc. Uh, the farmers are already in process of adopting, but they just do not know because it's like a moving goalpost, right? Things are changing every year, every season you see something different. Technologies do exist already on how to address. For example, you know, as the heat rises, the wheat you know, is expected 20 to 30% lower productivity. But you can actually create a microclimate through irrigation or whatever else so that that heat impact can be taken out. So these uh, solutions do exist. One has to just see how do you reach out to all these you know, farmers uh, to make it viable, cost-effective way, cost-effective solution. That's the challenge. So the last word, Rotash, which I rarely get. <laughs> um, God will do what he will do. I think we've got to do what we can do. And the first thing is um, 
these 151 districts, for example, how do we uh, how do we get water out? Technologies are now beginning. Magnetic resonance technologies are beginning to be seen, which divine exactly where water is under the ground and pump it out. Right? We'll have to invest in that. Now that's for areas which are which are drought intensive. What do we, what about areas that have surplus monsoon and therefore kill crops? Right? Insurance has to kick in in a very huge way. I I think we barely scratched the surface there. Insurance has to kick in because if our focus is not on the farm but on the farmer, we got to make sure that uh, his efforts don't go in vain. Thirdly, uh, back to Anil, technologies are coming in where early warning signals are available. For example, um, usually uh, farmers used to wait for crops to come to full color, so to speak, before harvesting. Now, if you know that a storm is approaching, You'd better get that off the field. More importantly, don't leave it as a mountain on the field. You harvest it, you sort, grade, pack, and get it out of there as quickly as you can. So we've, we've got to find ways and means, and there are possibilities right in front of us to be able to apply on a lot of these solutions. We can't obviate or, uh, the, the effects of climate change. More importantly, the violent changes in climate that we are beginning to see, but um, but measures are available, and more and more are going to be available. I think both private sector and government have to go out and seek these and make sure that they're implanted on the ground, not at a national level, not at a state level, but literally at a district or a sub-district level. There will be different solutions for small areas. Excellent. Well, we're. I want to thank all of you for a superb panel and superb discussion. Um, uh, and I want to let those who are in the room know that we will be putting out a publication based on, on this panel's discussion uh, and some interviews we have with the panelists prior to coming here to Des Moines. Um, and that will be out sometime, I would say, in the next six weeks or two months. Meanwhile, I want to ask all of you to join with me in thanking the panelists for their, for their time and contributions. <laughs>